So this is data in the next decade, what to expect and how to prepare. This is part of the Marketing AI Institute webinar series, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Marketing AI Institute in a moment if you're not familiar. Let me do a quick introduction for Lori and myself. Lori is the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Mobile Walla. So she is responsible for all aspects of Mobile Walla's marketing strategy, including messaging and positioning, brand awareness, demand generation, and sales enablement. So she keeps herself busy. She has extensive experience in technology marketing and product management. Prior to Mobile Walla, she was at Equifax and IBM through their acquisition of Silverpop, a marketing automation company. I know we have a lot of mutual friends from that those days. A lot of the people out from Silverpop and into the exact target and that whole, whole, whole crew. So early in her career, she worked with several marquee companies, including Knowledge Storm, S1 Corporation, and Accenture, gaining marketing, product management, and business partner management experience graduated from Clemson University and is uh, currently serving as a board member of the Technology Association of Georgia Marketing Society. I can also tell you, Lori and I have actually known each other for a short time, probably going back four to five months, and she's just one of my favorite people to talk to. It's always a kind of a joy to spend some time with Lori, and I'm excited to do this webinar together. For those of you who don't know me, I am the founder and CEO of Marketing A Institute and PR 2020. So I started PR 2020 in 2005. We were HubSpot's first partner agency. So we've been kind of in the marketing automation, marketing tech space going back to 2007. And then the Marketing AI Institute, we actually spun off out of PR 2020 in 2019 officially as an entity. The agenda today is quick about the Institute, and then really it's gonna be Lori walking us through data and the significance of data specifically to artificial intelligence, taking a look at the last decade, and then what's going on today and how that plays into AI machine learning, and some really important information around data score, data quality, because at the end of the day, data is the foundation of artificial intelligence. And whether it's your data, second party data, third party data, but you have to understand the quality of that data, how it's being used, where it came from, what bias exists within it. There's lots of things that we need to know, and most of us marketers aren't data scientists on the side. So what we wanna do is make this really understandable so that as marketers, we can actually uh, take this information and apply it. And then from there, we'll get into some steps to get started, and then we'll do some Q&A. So with that, just two quick pieces of information about the Marketing AI Institute. So if you want to um, take a look at what we try and do is make AI approachable and actionable for marketers. So we come at this as marketers. We aren't machine learning engineers. We're not data scientists. We were, you know, back in 2016 when we started the Institute, the idea was we knew it was going to be significant. We knew AI was going to play a major role in transforming the industry, but we didn't actually know what it was going to look like or who the main players were going to be or what marketers could actually do about it. So myself and Mike Caput, who's one of the people on the call with us today, who's the director of the Institute, just started researching and writing about AI. We were trying to figure out what is the story here. And so that's been our mission since then. We've published more than 600 articles and really started building education and content. So our focus is online content, education. I'll talk to you a little bit more about our new initiative in online education at the end here. And then events. So we actually launched the Marketing AI Conference or MACON last July. We were you know, originally hoping to have July 2020 be number two, but we've moved that into July of 2021 for, you know, for obvious reasons. The event is a core piece of our business. The, the number of users to the site has grown significantly. Subscriber base keeps growing. It grows about 1,000 to 1,500 new contacts a month. So what happened was we started writing about AI and thought if other people are interested as well, then we'll turn this into a business. And so that's kind of what happened very organically. We just wrote you know, two to three articles a week. I was doing a lot of speaking. I've probably done 80 to 100 talks around the world on marketing AI over the last four or five years. And in the process, we built up this really interesting audience of marketing leaders who are hungry for this kind of information. They're trying to understand AI, figure out how to pilot it, and figure out how to scale it. And so the way we do that is create a lot of content, and now we're making a much larger effort to bring in people like Lori and Mobile Walla to start telling their stories and bringing in their expertise and knowledge, because there's only so far we can take it with our internal knowledge. And so it's really now about opening up to the community and trying to bring all that 
interesting knowledge and use cases and experience to our subscribers, to our readers, to our listeners. And we are going to get going talking about data in the next decade. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And thank you, Paul, for such a kind introduction. I really appreciate it. I'm Lori Hood. And as Paul mentioned, I'm responsible for marketing at Mobile Walla. Mobile Wall is a consumer intelligence company, and we combine the industry's most robust data set with deep artificial intelligence expertise to help organizations better understand, model, and predict customer behavior. And we have recently partnered with the Marketing AI Institute to better engage with marketers and a community of folks who are interested in doing more with artificial intelligence and using it to support marketing use cases. I hope you guys walk away from this presentation with some new thinking around why you should be looking at ways to enrich your existing data and how you can better leverage that data within your business, especially when it comes to incorporating artificial intelligence techniques. The first part of the presentation is going to be a bit of a look back at how we got here with 2020 sort of being the start of the new decade. And the last part of the presentation is going to cover ideas around where to go next. We do have some polling questions, so you'll get an idea of where you stand as compared to your peers on the call. And I will say this is more about sort of overall trends and ideas and less of a kind of hands-on practitioner view. We do have a few use cases at the end that are going to give some real-world perspective, but I just wanted to give you some insight around the content. You know, while it seems like time flies, and I hate to say it, it only gets worse the older we get. If you're like me and you can't remember if something happened two months, two years, or 20 years ago, the reality is a lot can happen in a decade. And if you don't think that's the case, then let me tell you, in the last decade, last 10 years, Apple iPad 2010, Instagram 2010, Uber 2010, Lyft 2012, Slack 2014, Voice Assistance 2014. These have become things we completely take for granted. Look at automobile technology, for example. 10 years ago, side airbags were a big deal. Now there's integration with your mobile device, all sorts of warning sounds that your car makes, 360 degree cameras and parking assist. The other thing that happens over time and kind of switching gears from consumer advances to business advances, you know, not sure how many of you are familiar with Scott Brinker's MarTech landscape. Your marketing has become the final frontier of business computing. Manufacturing and supply chain had their day and the back office and finance and the accounting apps have had their day. But now it's marketing's turn and marketing is where tremendous investment and advances are taking place. There have been lots of stats and opinions released. I think Gartner was one of the first to talk about the CMO having more power and more spend than the CIO. And as you can see, the result is over 8,000 products and services in the marketing landscape. And this is hot off the press. Now, the interesting thing is Scott Brinker started this tracking in 2011 with 150 technology companies. This goes up to 2019, where there were over 7,000, and now we're up to over 8,000. So again, a lot can change in 10 years. So kind of going hand in hand with this transformation of marketing technology, and really technologies in general, has been our massive collection of data. So think about the last 10 years also as this era of big data. And if you follow kind of the concepts of different industrial stages from industry 1.0 being the industrial revolution and mechanization, manufacturing, the steam engine, then moving on to electrification, telegraph, mass production, to what many consider the computer age or industry 3.0 with the internet, digital manufacturing, networks, automation, and then finally positioning ourselves for internet 4.0, which includes big data, analytics, advanced robotics, IoT, AI, machine learning, resulting in this highly connected environment of data, people, processes, services and systems that drive innovation and collaboration. Let's go to our first polling question and talk about your maturity level around collecting and leveraging data. 
wait, were we supposed to be collecting data? We have our good days and our bad days, or throw a little fun in there, we are the Jedi Knight data collection. Now you can answer this from your company or your team. And again, we tried to make it kind of fun with the different choices. And it looks like a good mix of, you know, we have our good days and our bad days seems to be the most of the group with some still really just getting started and other folks on the call, you're know, really feeling like what you've been doing is very advanced. So that's great information to share. And we're going to do a couple other polling questions as we move through this. I feel like people are always interested in kind of understanding where they stand with their peers. So regardless of where you stand, Jedi Knighthood should be your goal. And there are plenty of stats in this area and they all say that data-driven organizations are much more successful, especially in the case of applying data to marketing use cases. So if this is where everybody wants to be, then let's explore some of the reasons why people are struggling to get there. And we're gonna to go to our next polling question. Now, it felt like people have been making pretty good progress already, but let's talk about what are some of the biggest challenges your organization is facing today around collecting and using data? This is geared a little more towards your team, but um, you could certainly have it relate to your entire organization. We often see that teams have a great grasp on the data they have access to, although that data is often limited, but then it breaks down when they look at data across the broader organization that they can't get access to it, data is not clean, it's unstructured, they can't link and get a single view. So if we look at this poll, it looks like combining data sources to create a single view is where we're seeing the biggest challenge right now with this group. Although closely followed by finding additional sources of data and getting access to their own data. Let's talk about what's driving the explosion in all of this data. We all interact with data every day, and this is an IDC stat that shows one interaction every 18 seconds for those of you who just checked your mobile phones. And then if we look ahead, it becomes even more interesting. We're just going to keep generating more and more and more data. And yes, that is 21 zeros after the 18 on this slide. Individuals are interacting with data every day, and these interactions just create more data. And everything we do leaves a digital trace. My husband and I were on vacation. We weren't even in the US. We were talking about a local Atlanta company, not a major brand, a smallish B2B company. And five seconds later, they showed up in his Instagram feed. So everything is watching and everything is listening. And all of this data just continues to be collected. Another source of data is the increased complexity in the customer journey. So gone are the days of consumers exploring their options through one or two channels and making a decision based on price alone. I'll go back to my car example. Back in the day when you bought a car, you went to the street in your town with all the car dealerships. You guys know where I'm talking about. You had a basic idea of what were you going to buy, maybe either from TV or a print ad or the car that all your buddies were driving. Test drove a few cars, negotiated, and drove away. Now you can buy a car online, which I actually did in 2011. You can close on a loan online, buy a car from a kiosk. When you're doing your research, you're going to automobile comparison site, shopping for the best loan deal, asking friends on Facebook for recommendations. You're doing this myriad of digital activities and you're creating massive amounts of data along the way. You've got changes in the way consumers are engaging, but then you've got these disruptors that are another factor driving the data explosion. As we've said, a lot can happen in a decade, and many of these companies were market entrants in the last 10 years. Venmo has changed the way people pay each other. Amazon changed the way people grocery shop. Peloton has changed the way that people exercise, which I would tell you Peloton is a medieval torture device, but that may be just me. Even more interesting is the way these disruptors think about themselves. 
They are technology companies. They are highly enabled technology companies. They don't think of themselves as grocery stores. They don't think of themselves as exercise bike manufacturers, but technology companies that today are in the business of solving a problem. But tomorrow may pivot into solving a different problem, a totally different problem or maybe a related problem, but they're gonna leverage the capabilities that they have built and the data that they have access to. So we've talked about data, but the reality is Data doesn't do anything on its own. It's more about what you do with it. And there's a concept about being data rich and insights poor. And fundamentally, that is really what this next revolution is about. So how do we take all of that data that we've been gathering and we're clearly going to continue to gather and how do we make it matter? How do we make it matter for our business? And that's going to transition us into now talking more about artificial intelligence and machine learning. We all hear that AI has come, become pervasive, but what does this really mean? And does everyone really feel that way? There are two sides to the AI discussion. One side is the use of AI-enabled technologies, so things like voice response, chatbots, et cetera. These technologies leverage AI capabilities to function. It's part of their DNA. The other side is using machine learning algorithms to create insights and predict outcomes. Machine learning and predictive modeling, they're being used to support many marketing use cases, and that's only really going to continue and grow. AI is also used in many other parts of the business, many industries, but this broad adoption of AI and something to keep in mind as we go deeper into this topic is resulting in significant talent shortages, which ultimately is going to impact the AI adoption curve. So let's talk a little bit about maturity levels around AI adoption. And again, trying to have some fun with this one. Um, are you a toddler new to AI and still trying to implement? Are you a teenager? We're using it, but haven't seen any real business benefit. I'm sure with a lot of big size and eye rolls and shoulder shrugs. Are you adulting? We've been using it and have started to see some business benefit. Or, okay, boomer, we get it and we are using it effectively to drive our business. It looks like a lot of people are just really still new to this and are still trying to implement and drive that internal value, which is great because we're going to go a little bit deeper into what we can do with AI and what some use cases that you can look at. Let's talk about more broadly what some of the top challenges are in um, implementing AI and machine learning. You know, I touched a little bit on skills challenges already. If you can't hire the right people, you can't implement the technology. Understanding the benefits and uses of AI is another issue. There's a lot of work that needs to be done internally. Selling AI, building an understanding of what AI can and can't do. And it's going to be hard to sell an investment to people who don't understand um, what the potential is with AI and what you can do. Data is another key issue. Data is the fuel for AI. So if you lack kind of breadth, depth, and scope of data, your efforts with AI and machine learning will not be successful. So we're going to go to our last polling question on the biggest challenges to AI adoption. We've included some of the key ones from the previous slide and curious to see if this group has similar issues. Internal, is it an internal challenge understanding benefits and uses? Is it a skill set issue? We can't hire the right skills. Is it access to breadth and depth of data to make it effective? Or is it finding the right use cases and where to get started? And I mean, the interesting thing is, the, these are all really intertwined. You know, if you can't do the skill set, then does it matter if you've got the use cases? And we'll talk at the end kind of about where to start. But it looks like actually on this poll, we've got a pretty good mix with internal understanding, 
and finding the right use cases. So let's jump in and talk first about data scope and quality because we've talked about the importance of data to AI. And we're taking a little bit of a step back and we'll talk about the three different types of data. First party data is data you collect directly and that you, you can get from your customer by simply asking them questions. You can get it systematically through your engagement with them, for example, tracking purchase behavior. You can derive it from other data points. So maybe if someone always purchases women's clothing, you may, may decide that they are female. Second party data is someone else's first party data. And it's usually gonna be acquired through some sort of trusted partner relationship or maybe through an industry consortium. Third party data is aggregated data that's bought through a third party vendor, like a mobile walla, who does not have a direct relationship with the consumer, but is compiling kind of this anonymous customer information, they're compiling and aggregating it, like browsing behavior or location data, across a variety of data sources, and then deriving additional demographics and behaviors. So let's talk a little bit kind of about pros and cons of each type. First party data is gonna be your go-to. You already own it, Typically, it's going to be your most accurate and most reliable because you have directly collected it. If done properly, you should not have any privacy or consent issues around the collection and usage of that data. The biggest issue you're going to have with first-party data is quantity. The scale is often limited in breadth and depth. First party data is also only relevant to your existing customers and may not give you data points to model external customers for acquisition. You also most likely have a lot of pockets of first party data across your company that you may or may not own and you may or may not be able to get access to. A lot of times this data may lack structure or you may not be able to key the data to build that 360 degree view of a customer. Second party data, similar challenges to first party data. Again, high quality, but typically lacks quantity. You also may struggle to kind of to bring that data in and to key it across your multiple data sources. Third party data is gonna give you the scale that you lack and can bring that breadth and depth of data in to paint that complete customer picture. Third party data can either be declared observed or inferred, bringing you kind of more demographic and behavioral context. The addition of third-party data is going to significantly increase the data points that you have or the features that you can use when you're doing predictive modeling and also is going to provide data that's going to give you a perspective that you can use when attracting new customers. Negative about third-party data is that it is not unique to you. Now, the way you use that data can certainly be unique and give you a competitive advantage, but it's data available on the market that others may also be leveraging. So all of these data sources, again, kind of build on each other, and you want to look at your different opportunities to bring them together. When you're looking at a third-party vendor, a couple things that you want to keep in mind are privacy and consent compliance. Privacy is a huge issue. They should be able to talk about what their frameworks are, what their strategies are, how they're notifying other partners, how they're processing those requests. You want to partner with somebody who's got significant breadth and depth of data. You might be interested in kind of global coverage. You want to make sure they're getting a high number of signals so they're capturing a lot of data. That's going to make what they have richer, that they're properly cleaning that data, and that they're linking that data themselves. So you really want to dig in and make sure that whoever you're partnering with has the kind of data to help meet your specific needs. Use of third-party data is becoming very common. You can see here that a lot of people are looking at third-party data in addition to their first-party data. We're also seeing some usage of second-party data. I think second-party data generally is harder to come by working with those different sources and, and trying to find it. But third-party data becoming important 
by enriching your data, it's going to expand what you know about your customer. It's going to allow you to communicate with them in a more timely and relevant and really a more personal manner. And also when you enrich your data, you're going to be able to build better data models and those are going to drive better informed decisions and ultimately deliver better business results. So at the end of the day, all the work that you're doing on this is really to increase business revenue, drive growth, and by bringing more data in, you're gonna have the information and what you need to bring that customer into focus. To create a more um, complete profile, you can usually include things like location, life stage, different interests, different behaviors, and really just have this much richer view. So we're gonna talk in a little bit more detail now about AI benefits and the different use cases. I tried to bucket this into categories, but there's a lot of overlap when you look at what you're trying to achieve with your marketing efforts. Fundamentally, what do we all wanna do? We wanna attract new customers, we wanna keep the ones we have, and we wanna ultimately be a growth driver for our business. And whether we do this through audience segmentation and targeting or personalization or competitive analysis, end game is to increase revenue and drive business results. AI can be very broadly defined as techniques that enable computers to mimic human behavior. So that's mimicking our ability to process information and make decisions. But using AI, we can do that with a much higher capacity, greater speed, and higher precision. Machine learning is a subset of AI, so that's about using statistical methods or algorithms to enable machines to improve with experience. I've included a chart here from Ray Wang, who's CEO of Constellation Research. And this is just a great way of mapping AI outcomes and that continuation of sophistication as you move up to each level. Your AI efforts are not gonna be successful without a clear idea of what you are trying to accomplish. And when you look at this continuum, there are marketing applications at each level. So if you just start simply, perception describes what's happening now. And it's the first set of outcomes that describes surroundings kind of as manually programmed. Notification tells you what you ask to know. You can notify through alerts, workflows, reminders, other signals that deliver additional information through manual input. Suggestion recommends action. Suggestions build on past behaviors and they're modified over time based on weighted attributes, decision management, and machine learning. We're starting to get a little more sophisticated. Automation repeats what you always want and enables leverage as the machine learning matures over time and tuning. Prediction informs you what to expect. So a lot of you are trying to predict outcomes or predict behaviors with your AI. Here you're gonna to start to build on deep learning and potentially use things like neural networks to anticipate and test for behaviors. Prevention, flip side, helps you avoid bad outcomes. So it applies these cognitive techniques to identify potential threats. And then situational awareness, kind of like self-actualization on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, tells you what you need to know right now. And it comes to the closest to mimicking human capabilities in decision making. So Let's jump in and let's talk about some specifics as it relates to marketers. Whether you're a B2B marketer or a B2C marketer, at the end of the day, it all boils down to, I want to get new customers, I want to keep the ones that I got, and I want to grow the business that I have with them. And when you look at that combination of data and AI, there are a lot of use cases that you can support through this. So if I think of it as, you know, how do I find and grow my best customers? A great example is high value customer identification. For most businesses, regardless of what they do, the 80-20 rule holds true. 20% of my customers drive 80% of my revenue. This ability to understand and precisely target this market can provide a significant impact to the bottom line. Even a small increase in percent can deliver a big payoff. As well, kind of augmenting my data and incorporating AI can help me with things like churn analysis. 
next best offer, likelihood to accept an offer. I want to try to predict a behavior, potentially positive, in the case of churn analysis, potentially negative, and I'm going to use data and AI to do that. So a specific example um, for, for Mobile Wallet, we partnered with a global food delivery company on high value customer identification and then targeting like prospects. And in this case, 15% of their customers were high value and that accounted for about 70% of their overall revenue. So what they wanted to do was create a marketing plan that would alter that mix, just even scooting it up a couple percentages to drive business growth. So they use machine learning driven predictive modeling to create portraits of high value customers, which could then be used to create target lists for new customer acquisition. So with their own data, they were able to model high value customer using classic RFM, recency, frequency, and monetary. But those features you couldn't really leverage them externally because, for example, if high value customers were women who ordered Chinese food three times a week after 8 p.m., while easy enough to target by gender, there's no real way of knowing what population, what part of the general public is ordering Chinese food, nor can you figure out when they typically order it. So if you can't identify the audience, you can't market to them. So as we've discussed, this illustrates a major limitation to first party data. The insights it generates are intrinsic only to your existing customers, but not necessarily helpful on making judgments on consumers that haven't engaged with your brand. So what we were able to do is we were able to enrich their first party data with third party data such as restaurant visit frequency, supermarket visit frequency, um, we were able to add marital status and some other key attributes that increased the breadth of data and allowed for more nuanced feature selection, which increased the predictiveness of their models and revealed additional attributes likely to be seen in their high value customers. So many were married between the ages of 25 and 34, had children, had a working spouse, and a key factor was a home to work commute greater than 15 kilometers. So married, two incomes, kids, and a far drive to work equated to someone who was likely to be a high value customer. And these features were able to predict on the general population. So now we can target those specific audiences of people who are more likely to become a high value customer. Another example of using AI in marketing is to deliver a more personalized experience. And we're all keeping up with this constantly moving target of consumer wants, needs, expectations. And the consumer has more power really than ever before. Consumers are driving the conversation because they've got a lot of different ways to engage. To win over this, this much more sophisticated and discerning consumer, you need to speak to who they are, what they wanted at an individual level, and you're gonna to need to do this by leveraging additional information on their demographics and behavior. The most relevant and accurate data that you gather, the more refined and detailed of a picture you can draw. So going back to our earlier point of bringing customers into focus. First party data is certainly key and modeling against the demographic information you have as well as what you know about customer behavior such as purchase history is a good starting point. But then you want to augment this data again to paint that complete picture. Personalized experiences definitely convert at a higher rate. We've also seen stats that consumers or customers are frustrated when there's no indication that a brand they do business with understands them, they know you've got this data, so they wonder why doesn't it look like you're using it? They know what they're doing with you and they wanna see that reflected in their interaction. So personalization needs a multifaceted approach. There are a lot of technologies that can deliver that personalization to the end point, but the key is really that you have the underlying data and you've done your modeling homework to deliver the right experience to 
the customer or prospect. I've got another example of a client that we worked with, a global mobile cell phone provider. And that business had long really been associated with a predominantly male tech savvy demographic. But for their newest device, they really wanted to connect with millennial females, equally savvy to the males, but with kind of a different focus. Males tend to focus more on gaming and apps, whereas female millennials are heavy users of social networks and also want a high quality camera that gives them a lot of editing and formatting options. So this company had made significant improvements to the camera. They saw this as an opportunity to better connect with this audience that had been less less affiliated with them. So gathered a lot of information and did a mobile campaign built to target that female millennial audience with more focused messaging, much more personalized, and saw a much higher rate of conversion many from competitive products and a significant increase in foot traffic. This was a digital campaign that they did using a programmatic mobile advertising. So lots of ways to do personalization, just a simple example, but data is going to make that experience a lot richer. So last example is understanding competitive preferences and activity. And how you would use that with more of a AI machine learning approach. Because understanding where somebody goes, what they do, who they live with, all of that has a significant impact on interests and brand loyalty. And you can incorporate additional data to model these attributes, understand brand affinity, and then use this information to target specific audience segments for campaigns. And I've got two campaign examples you know, the first one was a multinational grocery and retail brand, and they wanted to gain market share by driving foot traffic from their top competitor to their stores. So they did digital advertising, it defined customer target segments, and they measured offline impact through a footfall study. They reflected that the visitation increase was 520% uplift from the brand's customers, and over 800% uplift from the competitors' customers. And and what they did was modeled existing high-value customers and then sought new target customer segments based on those audience profiles. Our second example is another large telco brand, and they wanted to capture more high-value customers by, again, targeting competitor high value customers, they augmented their data with consumer behavioral data that looked at things like heavy data usage, such as downloaders, video and phone enthusiasts and gamers, the types of devices and handsets they owned. They did some tracking in their digital advertising and saw a 350 plus percent uplift, which was an equivalent to 20,000 additional unique visits to their stores during the campaign period. They also received a lot of different insights about the folks who had gone to their stores, such as the demographics, age, gender, and income, the distance traveled, time of day, and that allowed them to make these deeper connections, build more relevant messaging, and deliver marketing campaigns more quickly and that were more effective. So as I mentioned, a lot of these were tied together. I want to know who my best customers are. I'm going to target them in different ways, maybe through higher degrees of personalization, maybe through advertising that you know brings them into a brick and mortar store. I'm using data, enriching my first party with some third party data, and then using AI to do this modeling, to identify the right targets, and then I'm gonna market and go after them. So let's talk a little bit about getting started and then we'll open it up for questions. So where do you wanna start? As you look at moving forward, it's a little chicken and egg, but at the end, you kind of have to do all these things. So I would start with use cases. And from our polling questions, that was an area where a lot of people were challenged. What were the right use cases? Hopefully you've got some ideas from here. If you're new to this, 
I would start small, not with a grand giant project, but pick something important that you can really clearly define where you've got a clear defined end goal and start there. Acquisition, retention, it could be a personalization strategy. At the end, it's going to be about driving some kind of behavior that will most likely have a positive impact on your business. You're gonna to need to look at and understand the existing data. What do you have? What else can you get access to? What other data exists that you should integrate with? And then understand what your data gaps are. What's the knowledge that you need to help you successfully implement these use cases? And then start looking at you know, potential sources of that data and where you might be able to get it. There's a lot of information out in the market. You know, we're partnering with the Marketing AI Institute to work on bringing more sort of knowledge and thoughts around data, but you've got to educate yourself. It's a complex market. I think it's complex as a marketer looking at it and you just want to be smart, but I would say start small, start clearly defined, and then build on your success there. And just a little bit about Mobile Walla. We are a consumer data company, super deep data set. We are a massive artificial intelligence shop. We use AI and ML techniques against our own data. We've got you know, this incredible scale that we bring to our customers with the breadth and depth of data. We've got these tremendous insights when we talk about customer understanding and building that knowledge. And one of our significant skills is creating this cross-channel view of the customer, you know, using persistent keying and bringing that customer knowledge together. If you enjoyed Lori's presentation, she's actually going to be one of our more than 20 plus instructors for the new AI Academy for Marketers that we just launched. Oh, there you are. So you can go to marketingacademy.ai to learn more. The content goes live in July with more than 30 courses. And there's a track on data and analytics. So if you're just learning about data and analytics and you want to improve there, we have lots of content around that as well as category-specific content, marketing, advertising, social. And with that, we'll jump into Q&A. New privacy regulations are allowing people to opt out of being tracked. How is that ability to opt out affecting the validity and scope of third-party data? So what what are you seeing and kind of what advice can you give to marketers around the ability of consumers to opt out of data collection? There's two sides to, to this to talk about. From a consumer standpoint, while consumers have the ability to opt out, we're not really seeing them opt out overall. There's very much kind of a give to get with this data. A lot of the applications that collect the data are key applications that people like to use and, and require them to opt into, for example, things like location tracking. If you wanna get a weather app, it's great for that app to know where you are. So a lot of the data that is being collected tends to be in a give to get scenario. And when we've seen new phones come out where you've got to do different things to maybe turn on or turn off accepting or sharing your data, we're not seeing massive uptake from a consumer standpoint. Millennials, attitudes, and digital natives also seem to be more comfortable with the collecting and usage of data. So it will also be interesting to see how that evolves over time. But overall, the percentages of people opting out of data collection still continue to, to be low. Now that said though, it's incredibly important to partner with a data provider who is compliant with this across the board. It is, it is people's right to opt out of data collection and those requests need to be processed promptly. There is a lot about working with the partners that you share data with in communicating these opt out requests. So you want to ensure that anybody you choose to partner with is fully compliant. For example, we have a whole compliance framework that we talk about the steps that we take, the processes that we do. We work very closely with our legal counsel. It's something that definitely needs to be taken seriously from a vendor perspective. 
but we're right now to this point not seeing a massive impact from a consumer standpoint. And I think as marketers use that data to deliver value, that becomes a good thing for marketers and for the industry. Yeah, those are all great points. I even think just <clears throat> some the simple approach of like GDPR and everyone was so worried when we had to put up like, you know, here's how we use your data. Do you accept? And I think you've just become, you just click except like, okay, I get it. You're going to yeah. use my data. Like it's fine. So yeah, it's, you know, not that people have come numb to it, but I agree. It's, it's a value exchange. And if you're providing enough value, people accept the fact that you're going to likely collect data in the process. Yeah. So one we get all the time and actually someone did submit this one from Kevin. What about small businesses when you have nothing, but you want to get started? So there are lots of small to mid-sized businesses that understand AI has all this potential, but they're going to need likely data to do it. Like what kind of guidance do you offer for these businesses that don't have data science teams and maybe they don't have a ton of first party data? So for a smaller business, I think data is probably the least of your problems. Skill set is going to be a bigger challenge. And I would look in a couple directions. I would look for a partner, a reputable partner. There are a lot of smallish kind of AI shops out there who could work with you on doing projects for you internally. There are some opportunities to buy packaged models. There are people who have, you know, kind of a standard acquisition model that you could take and they could help you modify. But it's going to break down to, again, you got to understand your use cases. You got to understand the problem that you want to solve. I would look for a reputable partner if you're unable to bring those skills in-house, and then I would work on expanding that relationship, and they should also be able to help guide you in terms of the kinds of data that you want, might want to source and you would need for that. And I think you really need to think through whether you need to bring data scientists in-house or whether you can look at working with another organization on it. I think you had talked about use cases, and that's such a critical part, because the reality is most businesses, even a lot of the enterprises we talk to, when they're thinking about artificial intelligence, they're trying to find like one to three pilot use cases. They're yeah. not trying to just switch over everything and restructure their team and upscale. So you're trying as a small business to look for where are there lots of time and in, time invested where maybe there's inefficiencies where you may be able to find smarter processes to do something. So like for our agency, we're looking at media buying. So specifically digital advertising and using a tool like a word stream that has some machine learning in it that makes recommendations of ways to improve performance or a smart newsletter where we're using AI to develop and send a newsletter um, or we're looking at one that's like a knowledge assistant on the site. So none of those require a massive amount of our data and we're a small business. Now when you get into the predictive modeling like you were showing those case studies around, now you're talking about the need to probably, if you don't have data scientists, probably bring in some consultants yeah. that know what they're looking at and can guide you on what you're going to need and what your current data looks like and how to enrich it. So it, it really just depends on how you're thinking about using AI. Correct. And I think it goes back to there's a lot of AI enabled technologies out there that marketers can use today to deliver benefit, even content creation, content analysis, things like that. So you want to think through that. And then there's moving up to that next level of doing actual AI and machine learning against your own data to help drive some sort of conclusion or some sort of behavior. A lot of this also depends on how automated you are in your customer engagements as well. Some of it can be done real time. Some of it can be used more for targeting, but there's, there's so many options out there and, and so many ways to add value. We have time for one more and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. But this is probably a good one just given you know, everything that's going on with the global health crisis, coronavirus. What is the impact of this? I mean, when you think about, I, I think I read an article in TechCrunch this morning, like machine learning AI is based on historical data. It's largely making predictions about future outcomes based on historical data. So when we think about the changing behavior of consumers over the last two to three months where now we have stay at home and we have of you know, more online purchasing, how does your organization think about the data that we're taking in in the current climate and how that projects out moving forward and kind of what guidance do you give marketers there? Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, we've actually been working with some health services providers using our data to look at mobility patterns and pandemic spread prediction from that. So, so there's 
there, there is kind of an interesting side to consumer data and consumer behavior and what's the broader impact. I think as a marketer, a lot of us have really had to step back and really had to kind of reach tool for this. And on the B2B side, you know, it's certainly different than the, the challenges on the B2C side. But I do think that the, the more you knew about your customers today, the more you could plow that information into how you're engaging with them during this time. And it all comes back to really leveraging what you have, enriching what you have, and understanding the customer and building those deep relationships. Because I do think people want to continue to engage with those brands where they have a sense of brand loyalty and, and they feel like that's a brand that I'm going to stick with. And I think it just amplifies that need to have that understanding and to be able to translate that knowledge into different channels where if you were brick and mortar and now everybody's online, I think so many people were caught with this just not having mailing lists, not having that information to even be able to communicate with their customers. You know, personal example, my nail salon, I would have loved to have been able to send them some money or buy a gift card online. And, you know, when everything shut down, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, when everything shut down in Georgia, that was just done. So I think as, as whatever kind of brand you are, the more you have, the more you know, the more you can leverage it. And I think this sort of crisis has really brought that to the forefront. What are your thoughts on it? I just think that the, the modeling, you know, if you're doing it based on predictive data, which, you know, again, is one of the use cases you're trying to predict, but, you know, consumer behavior, those models are inherently going to need to be revisited. You're going to have to look at the quality of the data, where are the predictions coming from. So depending, again, on the size of the business and what data you're using to make predictions and how those predictions are playing into your business, I think a lot of people are probably stepping back and taking a fresh look at that, but hopefully also not running into this again in the future. If we ever have a situation like this again, that we're not relying on the AI to, to make decisions. It's there. It's always a human plus machine scenario. And I think more than yeah. anything, that's what it's demonstrating is the human still has to be in the loop, still has to be the decision maker. And you have to probably question the recommendations and predictions maybe more than we did, you know, eight weeks ago. And I think for me, that's one of the big takeaways. Well, and I also think when you look at data and data collected during this time, how are people's behaviors going to change? And, and is this data more of an anomaly at some point because we were all at home? And how does that change when people start getting out more? I think we are going to have to be more sensitive to looking at as we look at data over time, what does this data really mean? And has the pandemic sort of permanently influenced behavior or do we all have short memories and six months from now, it'll be like nothing changed and I, yeah. none of us know. I think that's the crazy frustrating part about it. That's a good place to end on. We always talk about the more intelligent, more human. The whole point of AI is actually to enrich what we do as humans. And I think human intuition and strategy, like they're going to become more critical. We're not going to be able to rely purely on mathematical models to predict behavior come fall when no human has ever even seen what we're heading into in terms of consumer behavior. So no machine has the models to, to make those predictions. Thank you again for everybody that joined today. Thanks to Lori for an incredible presentation and Mobile Walla for their sponsorship and support of the Institute. Fantastic. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks, Paul. Thanks All to right. AI Institute.